Good morning. Uh, welcome to lecture 24 for EC402. Today I want to talk about wave shaping. And uh, wave shaping is also known under other names. Uh, sometimes people will call it nonlinear filtering or memoryless distortion. So you've seen wave shapers before. Uh, if you're a programmer, you might just call it a table lookup. Uh, that's kind of a boring name. Wave shaper sounds cooler. But uh, yes, so so it's called memoryless distortion because you have some index into a table and then you get an output. But there's no z to the minus ones involved. There's nothing like that. Uh, it's just a time domain uh, direct transfer function or a table lookup. You've seen them in the past, like uh, you've seen uh, uses of ones that looked uh, uh, kind of like this. They, they go uh, from a low value to low value for uh, say, uh, simulating read effect in nonlinear uh, feedback and physical models, uh, or maybe some other uh, sort of lookup uh, in physical models. Here is a uh, normal use of wave shapers. I don't know if normal is the right word, but uh, today we're going to, I'm going to talk uh, primarily about uh, work that uh, Jim Beauchamp and others have done in the wave shaping for musical synthesis. Now, wave shaping has its beginnings in analog synthesizers, and uh, you could do various non uh, nonlinear distortions in analog synthesizers, but it's actually uh, fairly well suited to digital because, well, it's so easy to do a table lookup. It's hard to do an arbitrary function in analog, and even in the Egan matrix, where you usually don't use table lookups, but instead evaluate um, uh, some uh, digital summation formula, all the same, it's still... Um, uh, it's still a, a very straightforward implementation. Now, what can I say here? Um, so high quality digital wave shaping is pretty easy to uh, implement. You do a table lookup and you have to worry about interpolation. You have to worry about small values in your table. And if you look back again, for instance, the, the physical modeling example, a historical one I showed that used this kind of wave shaper, uh, there's various tricks you can do to avoid the problems at low amplitudes. In the Egan matrix, rather than try to do those tricks, I just evaluate everything in floating point. But uh, there's various ways to work around it. And in general, uh, it's either a table lookup or a function evaluation and uh, is uh, quite straightforward. Now, here, I want to give two examples of wave shapers just so you have an intuitive uh, feeling for it. Um, X here is an input into a, a lookup, and Y here is output. So, this here is a hard clipping function. What does that mean? Well, in this area here, the input equals the output. But once the input here exceeds certain value, the output no longer goes up. And so that's hard clipping. Same thing on the negative side. So that's hard clipping. So my question for you is, can you draw a soft clipping wave shaper using a, a sinusoidal sort of shape? Um, you could certainly use things besides a sinusoid, although in the Egan matrix, we most commonly use a sinusoid just because it's so convenient. But um, I'll let you go ahead and stop the video and uh, try to draw a soft clipper here. Uh, please do that now just to make sure that uh, you understand at all what's going on. Okay, assuming you did that, uh, your soft clipper should uh, look something like this. This isn't a, a very accurate drawing, but you get the idea. Uh, you have an input X here uh, at small values. Uh, you have a, a straight line here, as you know from uh, uh, your uh, uh, math background. Uh, you have quite a straight line here, but as you go higher, uh, it eventually uh, flattens out in a sinusoidal sort of shape. So that's a sinusoidal short clip, uh, soft clipper. Uh, another example here is this one here, which is a full wave rectifier, right? Positive values remain unchanged, negative values turn to positive on the output. So how would you draw a half wave rectifier? Again, if you want to stop the video. And here we go. Uh, hopefully you drew something like that. Uh, there's a half wave rectifier. All right, so why would this be called nonlinear distortion? Why is that our uh, memoryless distortion? 
Well, memory list, because there's just a table lookup. You're taking the current value and you get an output. Uh, so there's no memory in it. So that memory list is easy. Distortion, what is that? Well, if you have uh, an input here, say a sinusoid that's low amplitude, this actually doesn't uh, distort it. Um, but if your sine amplitude goes very high, right, if it goes beyond this point, you'll end up with a sinusoid that, say this was your original sinusoid, um, if this is a very large value, the hard, the, um, hard clipper here will just flatten it. Right? So instead of having a nice rounded thing and having only one frequency, now you've added lots of harmonics because you got these sharp corners where it's sharp, uh, hard clipped. And even the soft clipper adds harmonics. Not, not as suddenly, uh, not all at once, but uh, so that's why uh, it would be called distortion uh, or harmonic distortion synthesis. There's many other words for it. Um, it's because uh, you'll always add harmonics. Same thing here. If you do a, a rectifier like this, right? If you take a sinusoid and you rectify it, all of a sudden you have very sharp corners in it. You have lots and lots of harmonics. So, uh, in fact, you, you lose the fundamental in this one and you, uh, you only have harmonics that are very strong. So you have to be... Uh, 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 you are getting harmonic distortion here. And like I mentioned in the last lecture, you have to worry about aliasing because you'll get distortion that goes beyond the sample, the half sample rate. Well, unless you're careful. And that's what this next thing is going to be about. If we pick uh, our input uh, to be a sinusoid and we use a polynomial wave shaping function, then things work out very nicely. And this is um, a topic that I said, like uh, Professor Beauchamp, my predecessor here at U of I, and others have uh, worked on extensively uh, using this setup for synthesis. So you have a sinusoid going into a polynomial wave shaping function. Well, okay, just listening to a sinusoid is not so interesting. But if you put it through a polynomial wave shaping function, if it's the right polynomial wave shaping, you can get interesting harmonics. You can get quite a beautiful sound out of it something much more interesting than just a sinusoid. And if you observe here, you know some things about wave shapers. For instance, if you have low amplitude, you might have fewer harmonics, like here you don't get any harmonics. But if you go to higher amplitudes, then you'll get the harmonics in. And again, you have that here too. If you have a sinusoid and polynomial wave shaper, um, you can make it so that at low amplitudes, there's very few harmonics or it's mellow. But as you get louder, input sinusoid, the output from the polynomial wave shaping function will be much brighter. And we'll talk about that more, but it's very important up front. I want you to understand fundamentally um, uh, in an intuitive way, wh why do we do this? Why do we have a sinusoid in particular? Why don't we use a triangle wave? Why don't we use some other function? In, and why is it a polynomial wave shaping function? Why don't we just draw one by hand like this? Why don't we do something else? So, we're only looking at sinusoidal input here, and we only look at polynomial wavetable functions. And I want you to know why. Well, let's talk about the polynomial wave shaping function. We'll call it a capital F of X. And again, this is out of the EC302 notes by uh, Professor Beauchamp. You are responsible, like it says at the top of the page, only for the stuff I talk about here in class. Uh, not all of that uh, chapter. Okay, so um, if you have f of x, if it's polynomial, it's a naught plus a1x plus a2x squared all the way up to a sub n x to the nth power. Okay, so that's very straightforward. That's what a polynomial is. Everybody knows that. In this case, x, we're going to define as alpha cosine of theta. Okay, so this is, it's boring to write alpha cosine of theta all the time, especially where theta is 2 pi F1t, where F1 would be the fundamental, 2 pi F1t. So what this is, is alpha, x is alpha cosine of 2 pi F1t. That is our input function. Now, t is going to vary, right? You have different t's, but it, it's going to be basically a sinusoid at F, uh, frequency F1. Right, that's the input. That's what we're going to have as an input. We already said that several times here. Our, we're only going to have a sinusoid input. In fact, this is it. So this is the sinusoid input. We just call that X here because, hey, it's the input to the wave shaper. And um, 
here's f of x, same thing as up here, just expressed as a sum. Uh, as a sum. Now, I do keep in mind this theta here isn't a single angle. It's a function of uh, time and of, f, um, uh, of the fundamental frequency. So this is a polynomial wave shaper, and we're only putting... Uh, uh, we're only going to use a polynomial function to stick in the wave shaper, not something like this, which isn't a polynomial, but we're going to put uh, not, not something freehand drawn, but we're only going to use a polynomial, and uh, we're only going to put in a sinusoid. Now, if you look at the polynomial, what is it doing? It's taking different powers, uh, squared, third, all the way up to the nth power of the input. Okay? If you only have sinusoidal input, this is very important now. If you only have the sinusoidal input, how we defined x up there, then we know something about cosine to the kth power. And because we know something about cosine to the kth power, this whole thing makes sense. It makes sense to use uh, cosine as an input, and you know, that sinusoidal input, and then use a polynomial function. What comes out of that polynomial is a sum of cosine to the k, where k is different values, k is 2, k is 3, k is 4, uh, uh, so the output of this uh, polynomial, uh, of this uh, wave shaper, is just going to be a sum of uh, cosine to the k's powers for different k's. So let's look at cosine to the k's power. Uh, we have this a formula which at first looks uh, a, a, a little bit scary, but let's look at what this is. Uh, it says one-half to the k minus one power. So this is just uh, some scalar. i to the k over two. Cki, so this is the, of each, for each um, uh, cosine to kth power gets you something that's harmonic, right? It's a sum of cosines. And cosine to the kth power, if you look here, this is k minus two i. Um, times the input uh, frequency. So what does that mean? Well, that means if k is odd, say k is 5, all the frequencies present in k, a cosine of the fifth, what are they going to be? What are these frequencies are going to be? Well, say it's 5 minus 2i, so it's 5 times uh, the original frequency, 3 times the original frequency, 1 times the original frequency, right? You're going to get uh, 5 minus 2i, where i is 0, 1, 2, 3, um, uh, or 1 and 2. Uh, and uh, so you're going to get only odd harmonics. So if you have cosine to odd power, it'll only give you odd harmonics. And it'll be band limited. If k is 5, say, this will be at 5 times the frequency is the highest harmonic you're going to get. And you'll get one at three times frequency, and then the fundamental at one times frequency. If k is even, you will only get even harmonics. So uh, then, as, in fact, as you know, if you do cosine squared, you don't even have the fundamental anymore, right? It's a, you, you have the thing at uh, twice the frequency here. And you have some... Uh, so, uh, uh, again, if, if k... Here, it determines two things. If k is even, you only get even harmonics. If k is odd, you only get odd harmonics. Also, the value of k is the value of the highest harmonic you're going to get. Um, how loud are those harmonics? Well, you have this binomial coefficient here. Uh, you've seen this as k choose i. Um, you have this thing here. Uh, okay, okay. It looks a little funny, but hey, um, you know what the amplitudes of each of those harmonics are going to be. So again, if you have k as an odd power, you know how loud each of the odd harmonics is going to be. Uh, I will not require you, by the way, to know this derivation here, uh, but I do want you to intuitively understand this resulting formula. All right. So this, in some sense, really isn't that complicated, but it's very e easy to get confused about what is going on, which coefficients we're talking about, and uh, so I'm going to keep hammering on this because otherwise, if you just sort of race through this and don't keep things straight, it, it just all becomes mush. So sinusoid in the polynomial wave shaper produces a band-limited output. 
up to harmonic n. So if you have polynomial n, where n is the order of the polynomial. So um, uh, you have a band-limited output. Very nice for musical synthesis, right? Normally, wave shaping has aliasing problems and stuff, but this doesn't because if you use a polynomial wave shape or sinusoidal input, you know from the math on the previous page, you've got uh, its band-limited harmonic n. For a single input amplitude alpha naught, now this is uh, something that you can tell from the formula, but I'm just telling you now and then we'll talk about it a little more. Uh, for a single amplitude alpha naught, you can pick an alpha naught. Usually we just pick alpha naught being one. It's just simpler that way. So if you pick an alpha there, um, let's say um, alpha equals one, you can choose the output spectrum. You have total control over the output spectrum. So think about that again. You can see how loud the outputs are. So let's look at this here. So you have a alpha knot coming in here, a single sinusoid, if this is uh, magnitude and frequency, um, at frequency F1, amplitude alpha knot. Like I say, usually we use one for this. Then you can choose what the spectrum is here. It's, it's strictly band limited to n partials, and you can choose what the amplitude of each of these are. How do you choose that? Well, by choosing the right coefficients. Now, the important thing is these coefficients and these amplitudes are different things. Don't get them confused. The polynomial coefficients have to do with the wave shape or function, and the, uh, uh, these d's here are, are the amplitudes of the resulting spectrum for uh, your uh, uh, reference input. So that's very, very important, though, that, that uh, you don't confuse those two. Okay, so for some input alpha naught, usually we use one, uh, uh, amplitude one uh, cosine coming in, uh, you can uh, choose the output spectrum. Often uh, D1 through Dn are chosen to match the peak of, the, uh, of an attack of a time-varying sound. This is just a useful hint if you're going to do this. Um, uh, that's a good place to uh, t take a bright part of the sound. So... Now, if you change this alpha as the note goes on, like at the beginning of the sound, uh, it'll start from zero and very quickly go high, and then it'll start decaying. But you get a brighter output for bigger alpha and a mellower output for smaller alpha. This is musically really useful, but I want you to know what it means. So let's say here you have um, um, order five polynomial. That's kind of small, but let's say you had an order of, uh, n equals five polynomial. Then... At alpha naught, at, at your reference input, you'll get whatever spectrum you ask for all the way up to D5. Now, it's musically useful that it turns out if you reduce, if you have an input alpha cosine theta where alpha is less than alpha naught, there's a small value, then it's still band limited the same. You just have the same number of harmonics, but the higher harmonics uh, will die off faster than the lower harmonics. So it'll basically the sound will get mellower. Um, as uh, uh, as it gets quieter. And similarly, um, if you uh, increase alpha, then the higher harmonics grow faster than the uh, lower harmonics, so it'll get brighter. It'll remain band limited. The math on the previous page tells you the highest harmonic number is going to be the same, but its amplitude will change, get higher, uh, louder and smaller. So most acoustic sounds get brighter as they get louder and mellower as they get quieter. Uh, not all, but that's really common. So it's actually a really useful thing that when it's loud, the harmonics, the high harmonics have good, strong strength as, as your input alpha, if that's um, the amplitude of your uh, sinusoid input, goes down, the higher harmonics die out much faster than lower ones, so it gets mellower. So that's pretty cool. Now let's see how this magic works. I mean, I just said, oh, well, you have these A sub Ks, the coefficients for your wave shaper, and uh, you can choose whatever uh, these partials are, uh, well, partial amplitudes are. So uh, I want to convince you that that makes sense and it's intuitive. I, I'm not so interested in mathematical proofs of this as a real understanding of, like, why does this work? Why do we believe, you know, why would this make sense if you had to uh, spend your time doing this by hand, how would you even do it? How would you figure out what are the coefficients here to get the spectrum you desire? So what we desire is y equals f of x is a sum of cosines. 
uh, from dk naught um, cosine k theta. So, so at k times the frequency, uh, we want the different amplitudes. Okay, and the k naught refers to well, we're doing this for alpha naught, right? This is the reference input reference output spectrum. It's going to be different. The spectrum uh, amplitudes are going to be different if alpha does not equal alpha naught. But we're not worried about that right now. Right now, we're just trying to figure out: Does it make sense? Or how would you go about finding the coefficients a sub k so that when you have alpha naught for your amplitude for input, you have um, those d's, uh, d sub n's as the amplitudes of your uh, um, output partials. So if you want to do this, you can compute those a sub i's by this horrible formula, uh, I shouldn't say horrible, by this interesting formula here. So what you have here is you have k equals i comma 2. That just means increment by 2 in the sum, if you're not familiar with that um, uh, representation. And uh, k less than or equal to n. Then you got qi sub k times dk naught. So ai is a sum of a bunch of the other uh, dk naughts. Actually, the even AIs have to do with the even ones, and the odd ones have to do with the odd ones, as you know from the previous page. But uh, there you go. And the QA, uh, uh, IK in the uh, notes has some errors in it, I believe. But anyway, this is the uh, uh, formula for QI sub K. So this looks disgusting. You could try to compute this on your calculator. But you know what? You just write a program for it, and who cares? What I want you to understand is, why is it believable that this would work? You know, what is this mess? and be able to check particular situations. Well, if you go back and look at equation 5.3.4a, so if you go back and look at, uh, let's see if I can show both of these here. I think so, yeah. Um, so I'm saying go back and look at this equation. Now, if you want to figure out what's an easy output partial amplitude, you know, for this d sub ends here. Well, if you want the highest d sub n, you know, if, if you want d, say n equals 5, if you want to figure out d5, that's actually pretty easy because it turns out there's only one of the coefficients, right? The nth power one, the, the a sub n affects d sub n. Think about that for a second. a sub n affects only d sub n. It's the only one that affects d sub n. So say say n equals five, then cosine uh, the 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 um, uh, the a sub five is uh, affects uh, d sub five, and with some quite simple math that you could just do uh, on the back of a napkin, uh, you can figure out uh, what a sub five is in order to do uh, 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 to get a particular d sub five. Now let's say. Continue that example at n equals five. Uh, now let's say d sub four. Well, the only a sub uh, only a sub four affects d sub four, right? Because the even ones only affect the even ones. So you can uh, figure out also quite easily uh, what a sub four is to get your d sub desired d sub four. The a sub three is harder because a sub uh, the d sub three. If you look at the formula here, d sub three is affected by two coefficients by a sub 5 contributes to d3 and a sub 3 contributes to d sub 3. But anyway, as you work through this, you can kind of see how you could work from the highest, work your way down, and uh, certainly uh, uh, get the result you want. Because, for instance, for figuring out a sub 3, a sub 5 has already contributed some amount to uh, d, um, d sub 3, so a sub 3 has to contribute the rest. All right. I hope that intuitive explanation makes some sense. Uh, I'd like you to think about it uh, or ask me, ask, uh, ask me uh, by email or by on Piazza um, uh, about that if you thought about it and still doesn't make sense. But this is, uh, uh, this is, makes perfect sense that this would work. And uh, uh, to derive this formula to me is not as important as understanding intuitively why does a formula exist? Why can you believe it? And why does this whole setup make sense intuitively? All right, so now um, Professor Beauchamp in the 1980s and, and beyond 
uh, did a lot of work in wave shaping spectral synthesis. Here's an example that he had uh, that was quite effective. You have to remember here how simple the synthesis is. And again, you know, nowadays, sure, it, you can do synthesis that requires lots of computation power, like physical models or something, that gets you uh, more refined sounds in this, but this really is using very little data, very little resources uh, to get quite a good sound. Uh, so how does this work? Well, we've got a uh, cosine here, and it's got uh, some frequency. And then uh, we have an amplitude envelope on it and a wave shaper. And the job of this wave shaper is to match an existing analyzed sound as closely as possible for brightness throughout the sound. So at any point in the sound, uh, this the, the, the amplitude value there together with this wave shaper will get you the brightness desired. So this is called brightness mat, uh, matching. Um, so what is brightness? Well, it's the center of gravity of the spectrum. Here it's defined this way. So if you were to put your finger under the spectrum, where would it balance? If you have high harmonics that are very strong, if the kth harmonic is very strong, this will be a value much larger than one. If uh, the harmonics are very weak, it'll be a value very near one. So um, uh, you're matching the brightness here. So as you know, the harmonic distortion will make it, uh, I mean, this, this um, by using a polynomial wave shaper, as you put in bigger amplitude on the input, you will get stronger high harmonics. It's not that you'll get more harmonics, right? You'll, the thing is always band limited by whatever the order, um, whatever the, um, uh, this polynomial is. If it's an order n polynomial, you'll have n harmonics. But if your input sinusoid is louder, is, is higher amplitude, the higher harmonics of that band limited thing will be stronger. Then uh, the next thing uh, is uh, a second envelope which is to correct for RMS amplitude. Uh, what is that about? Well, it's often the case in acoustic instruments that when they're louder, then they're also brighter. But that's not always the case. For instance, at the puff, uh, at the beginning of a, a musical instrument, uh, a, 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 of a, a wind instrument, sometimes there's a puff that you can hear just at the beginning, which is very bright, but not very loud uh, before the... Uh, before you hear the main part of the note, main part of the attack. And so that would be an example where you'd want very bright, so the sinus would be very high amplitude here, and then be squashed down to very low amplitude uh, in order to correspond, uh, to, to better match the sound. There's a high-pass filter here, which is mostly there just because um, uh, Professor Beauchamp just explained to me, well, it sounded better that way. The highs just were always weak unless he had that. So um, there you go. So the brightness increases as harmonic amplitudes increase. Okay, so let's look at some results. Here at the top, we have uh, two graphs. Uh, uh, these are both uh, uh, courtesy of uh, Professor Beauchamp. Um, the time variant analysis for cornet tone on the left there, that's 356 hertz. And on the right is an alto sax at 247 hertz. Okay, so this is a cornet tone, and this is alto sax. And uh, you can see here, uh, this is a harmonic graph, very much like you had in the first home, in homework one. Uh, you can see this is time. You can see how the amplitudes vary. You can see uh, that uh, there's crazy stuff going on right here in the attack, and then look at the sustain, you can see that they have similar but not the same shape as each other. And then here's um, that uh, uh, cornet tone. Now, for this uh, uh, cornet and sax, you can figure out the brightness over time. And those are these are the two things. Now, this will determine that first envelope in the previous page to match brightness. So you're taking a sinusoid, putting it through the uh, wave shaper, uh, which has a spectrum determined at a, 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 a peak amplitude there. And then you do the envelopes, um, uh, I mean, a reference spectrum, but then you do the envelopes here to match the brightness over time.
you'll see some crazy things. This is just like in homework one. When the amplitude is really low, uh, your analysis data, of course, isn't, doesn't tell you a lot, and that's what's going on there. So then you have an RMS amplitude adjustment then uh, a afterwards uh, to, to make it, uh, uh, to adjust for bright parts that are quiet. Anyway, if you look at the synthesis data, you can look at it here and here. Um, yeah, compare these pictures to what's at the top of the page. It's actually kind of impressive. I mean, this is a pretty simple setup, right? One table lookup, two amplitude envelopes, you know, one sinusoid with, a, uh, with its own uh, uh, amplitude over time. Uh, so I guess three amplitude envelopes. Uh, no, I'm sorry. Uh, uh, with a frequency envelope over time. But um, uh, yeah, it is a quite simple setup. And uh, the results look similar to the top. But keep in mind, it's, uh, boy, uh, uh, there's a lot of details here and a lot of differences between partials that's lost here, right? Here, the partials are all sort of uh, made more uniform and they don't decay exactly the same way here because how these things decay, uh, depending on the alpha on the previous page, is sort of magically just part of what happens with the polynomial math. Uh, you don't have direct control over the decay. You just have control over amplitude of the spectra, um, spectral amplitudes at one input volume, and then for the rest of it, uh, you can match brightness. But exactly how it's matched, and exactly what harmonics contribute, how much is uh, going to be somewhat variable. Especially in the cornet tone here, you can tell the high harmonics are much more uh, uh, simplified over the other ones and, and follow each other much more than in the original, uh, I'm sorry, in the alto sax than in the original. Um, still, it's quite, a, uh, quite impressive uh, that in a uh, overall sort of way, there's a good match there. All right, uh, that's it for today. Thanks.